Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again I'm joined by Jim Simonetti, where we'll be speaking with Stevie Chalmers. Welcome to the show, Stevie. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, absolutely delighted to be here and speak to you guys. It's a pleasure. It's great to see you again. And uh, you've got a very famous name, obviously. So let's clear that one up straight away. For anyone who doesn't know you, uh, explain to us the, the connection you have to the great man who scored the winner in the European Cup final. Yeah, so that was my papa. Um, and yeah, as I kind of were chatting beforehand, you know, I've, I've known him as my papa, probably not the footballer, and I've had to learn him as a footballer since I was a kid. Um, I've known him as the golfer and the... The, you know, just just the, the man, I suppose, up until now. And I mean, I had the great pleasure and privilege of meeting your papa once. Spoke to him with Bobby Lennox mm-hmm. uh, up at Hamden, and he came across really humble. You know, a really humble gentleman. And uh, is that your memory, say, Stevie? Because when you think about him, Jim, as fans, I mean, it's the most important goal in Scottish footballing history. It's one of the greatest moments in British sporting history. Yeah, but it's your papa. Aye, and I think um, he's probably you're right there that he was probably particularly humble about it. He wasn't one for you know interviews and um, he wasn't one for pushing his face in. Um, There's probably a few of the other lines that were that were better at that than what he was. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously he was a, he was the one that got the goal and it was probably the most important goal in, in the history of the country. Never mind Celtic. So I'm just incredibly proud that that was the case, but. Again, yeah, as the man, it wasn't it wasn't something that kind of get shoved down your throat. It was something that you really had to learn, and it was probably other people who told me more than than him. And what you get as well when I did speak to him, you speak to certain footballers, and they, they'll tell you a funny story, or they'll you know they'll go back through the anecdotes. But what your granddad said to me was he was speaking about Neely Mocking, mm-hmm. but but he was speaking about him in glowing terms, like he was looking back. Uh, when they used to go to Seamill and him and Neely would basically meet up in one of their rooms for a pot of tea. Aye. And that that is what they were, that was their level, that's how they wanted to go about their business before a big game. Yeah. Because of course, Neely and your papa had played together. Yep. So they were friends first and foremost. But it ran in the family, didn't it? His dad was also a footballer. Yeah, so his dad, David, um, played for Clyde Bank as well. Um, it's probably something I should do a wee bit more research on to see um, a wee bit in terms of his career. But yeah, football was always around, and it, as you, it's funny you say that. But the, the pot of tea that's constantly in my family. There's a there's a pot of tea. You can smell the tea in the house, and um, that kind of yeah. My papa always had that at his cup there, and uh, had his own cup, and he had his own cup of tea, and that was kind of how he uh, conversed. Whereas a, probably a few of the other guys were were standing standing with a pint and. Um, Maybe a wee, a wee half next to it as well. Um, and don't get me wrong, they were all still um, together and whatever else, but he'd have been the one with the, if he was getting forced, he'd have a shandy rather than, a, rather than the pint and the half. Well, I remember, and I'm not talking out of school because Big John Fallon told me this story on this podcast a while back that uh, he shared the room with Ronnie, not just because they were goalies, but they were both smokers. Yep. So when they were at Simo Hydro, they yeah. were in the smoking room and if anybody fancied a wee smoke, they would go down to Ronnie and John's room. And then they had this cupboard with a chest underneath it and they opened the chest, it was empty, but there was like six pints of lager <laughs> so that if the gaffer came to the door, they could just shut the, the chest. Brilliant. They had it all worked out. You know? And of course, the man who scored the most important goal with the winning touch is sitting having a wee pot of tea yeah. with nearly mocking, you know. So I love that. I just love that, that image that that sparks. Uh, the, the image is, uh, uh, in, my, in my head, is, is absolutely brilliant. I've actually got it. In my head just now And um, You know we're talking about the goal That uh, Stevie's papa scored Celtic history Celtic history Through the years Up to then 1967 Was waiting for that They were waiting for that Historical moment uh, When uh, Stevie Chalmers Put that ball in the back of the net And it was magnificent For my grandparents and my great grandparents and all the Celtic families for years gone by before it. And then it's amazing that all the families since it as well, that's all now came to fruition and they're still taught about the Lisbon Lions and they talk about Stevie Chalmers and how he put that ball in the net and made 
and made history. And uh, he, he actually played here at Garkin Park mm. as well, which is absolutely brilliant, as did a, a lot of famous Celtic players. But I think Stevie Chalmers uh, was a lov- lovely, lovely man. Uh, I met him on a few occasions and he signed that uh, jersey right above Stevie's head there. And um, it was an absolute honour, a pleasure and a privilege to meet that man. A nicer guy that I felt you couldn't, you just couldn't meet. And I was fortunate to meet lots of Lisbon Lions. But Stevie Chalmers was special. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Jim. That's that. Hearing people say that is probably you know even better than people tell me how good a footballer he was or um, the goal he scored or this that and the other. It was it, it was a nice person and you know he obviously done a lot at Celtic Park in terms of the hospitality and stuff like that and met a lot of people and I still bump into the odd person that will tell me oh he was lovely had pleasure his company and told me this joke and Lennox came over and told him this joke and that as well. So th- those are the sort of memories that I, I like to keep as well and that's that means a lot to me to hear someone say that. It always amazes me when a talent runs in the family and um, Neely Malkin, uh, his two brothers, played as well, um, senior. His other brother actually played junior, he was a junior cap. And then obviously his nephew was John Sludden who played and it, it kind of runs on from there. It was a bit like... Your papa, his dad played, and then his son came through the ranks at Celtic, and he played. I mean, the whole family must have a great sense of pride that you've got two generations representing Celtic. Yeah, my uncle Paul played as well. Um, my dad played a wee bit. Um, so, yeah, and just me, turned out I wasn't good enough. But, <laughs> um, nah, I think we're just, we're, we love the game as well, and we're always around about it. Always remember having a ball my feet as well and our, me and my cousins constantly had a ball at our feet as well my cousin played a wee bit and um, I think it's just you love the game it's, it's, you know I don't think it's it's as you know it, it's, genet- it's genetic maybe it is but I don't think it is I think it's just that you, you're brought up around the game and you love the game and they're watching it playing it um, talking about it you know that's that, that was just always life really We've spoken to a few people where it maybe shouldn't have been a surprise. We Joe Miller's dad played for Swindon. John Calhoun's dad played for Oldham. Mm-hmm. You know, these things, I, I wasn't really aware of that. But you start thinking maybe it runs in the family. And unfortunately, my dad wasn't that good at football. <laughs> so it, it ran in my family as well. But then when you're looking at um, Paul playing for Celtic and not the great sense of pride that his dad must have felt, I did speak to Bobby Lennox on his own. It wasn't because your papa was there. And I used to speak to him about the reserve players that, that he trained because he was a reserve coach for years Bobby up mm-hmm. at the park and yep. he actually mentioned Paul he says you know I thought Paul had a chance so I mean he made a career for himself elsewhere didn't he? He did um, Paul had a Paul had a bad accident um, a bad car accident which kind of um, really put the, the stoppers on his career he was also at St Mirren as well um, and then he, he's left the game but yeah I spoke to a few people he says Paul was a very good player um, he was down at Swansea Spent a wee bit of time down there as well. Um, actually, one of my, my wee cousin Natalie, she was born in Swansea as well, so she tells her old she's Welsh, but I'm not having it. Um, so yeah, there, there's you know Paul. Paul's a really good player. Um, I, I don't know how he would have dealt. I'm not really asked Uncle Paul this, but how he would have dealt with the pressure as well, which is yeah. is obviously something that comes into it. Um, you know, I felt that a wee bit as a as a young kid. I think from my cousin Paul. Uh, Paul's boy Chris probably felt that as well um, and don't, don't get me wrong it wasn't added you know it wasn't something that was added or there was any pressure on us to, to be footballers or whatever but I think there's that constant comparison that's, that's always there um, I'm a very different build to what my, my uncle Paul and uh, my papa was so I was never going to be the, the, the whippet striker um, but even you know this, they heard my name and are you, when, even when I'm playing as a young kid are you be a striker no, no, not at all. Um, so that that's kind of there. Um, but yeah, Paul's a very talented guy, um, and he's he's a good person as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody in this room and most of the people listening, if not all of the people listening, know what the Lisbon Lions mean to us all and what they achieved and how important it was. Like Jim was saying bef- before, how important it was for the heritage, not only of the the club but of the people that follow the club, and you know, going right back. Jim to the the oppressed Irish in the eighteen 
80s and this was us becoming the European champions yeah. the greatest team in, in Europe and it was all done with the local lads famously um, when you look at that team of players the Lisbon Lions and the bond that they shared talk to us about some of your memories about their guys getting together well, to be honest you, you couldn't really get into here because they, they, would, they would find a table and, and probably the wives would, would tell you this as well like Sir Agnes Johnson and stuff like that will tell you this the, the wives were at one table and the lines were at another and even the kids as well <laughs> and they were around a circle and they were having their jokes between each other and um, and uh, so I probably didn't get in too much to hear the ins and the outs possibly for that was a that was a good thing with, with one or two of the characters in there but um, in terms of just, just the guys. I always just remember as a young kid, Billy, just at barrel chest, just standing over the toppy, and just so commanding. Just even in his stance and just who he was, and would never walk past you. Um, Bertie, uh, just telling jokes, and and I said to you earlier, probably telling the same jokes when I was four year old as he is telling just now. Um, <laughs> but funny, funny guy, and just he's great to be in his company. Um, Bobby Lennox was, was kind of very close with our family because he obviously he was soul coach and um, my papa and everybody else was kind of true uh, area so they were they were close and they would go up to the up to the games together and stuff so they were very tight and Bobby's just a lovely man he's just a lovely lovely guy um, and then the others just you wouldn't yeah, there's none of them would walk past you you would always got a pat in the head and how you doing son what you up to and just just they were all good people when Jinky obviously. Um, I think he's just a, a great guy as well and just when they're around just how they were, they were taking the mickey at each other and all that it was just 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 wonderful wonderful group of guys and to think that they were you know from such a short distance they, they Celtic part them all that, that'll never happen again ever ever um, and you know Jim mentioned earlier about you know how important the goal was but how important that the team played and the, the, the identity that that team played and the impact that probably had on football across, you know, across Europe certainly, that you were beating that Catanacho and you were beating that that defensive system, and you know it was that attack, attack, attack that that won out in the end. It was just, you know, that's probably. I, they would all say the same. Like they'd, they'd be bravado amongst them, but as a team, they were they were magnificent. They really were. Even with the great individuals that they had as a team, they were fantastic. It sounds as though they were great on the pitch and off it, Jim. Aye, aye, definitely. But Stephen says something quite important there. Individually, they were all great. Collectively, what a team. And I don't think any one of them thought they were an individual better than the other individual. They weren't allowed to, Jim. <laughs> no, they, they were so, so, so special. You know, it's amazing, even in the latter days of Jimmy's... A, a life when a, a, the Lions would all come out and visit including, including your, your papa and Bobby Lennox I've actually not miss anybody they all came and a, even the guys a, 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 in the pictures in the room Arthur Newman and a, Molly Henderson a John Gregg the great Sandy Jardin all these players of that help but when the Lisbons all come in a, to the room at times I, 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 I used to sit and just go Wow, wow! And you'd listen to their stories and back and forward. And even though uh, Jimmy Johnson was uh, suffering from that horrible uh, uh, illness, which is a uh, motor, motor neuron disease, the character that came out of him was so so special. The character for the rest of the lions run about them. By the way, they still laughed and they still joked, and it was great. And when he did see a uh, his comrades and his, his his fellow teammates coming back to see him and ordinary fans, it, it meant so much. Just like as Stephen saying about his papa, if he if he seen you or spoke to you, spoke to him, always had time for you. He always had time for the fans. Or I'll sign that a photograph. They were they were magic. They were, they were, it was actually it's quite hard to explain. When you've been in, in, in the presence of geniuses such as them, it's hard I, I to explain. I don't think I ever saw them knock back a signature. You know, never seen an autograph, not once did I ever see it. And I seen them get annoyed at maybe other players doing that, is when they were older guys and they, they get like, no, no, and it was about the fans. And that was, you know, I think going back to 
and it was the case, you know, they paid your wages, they were they were the people that you were playing for. That's who that's we need to spend some time with them. And they did. You're they right, did. you're right, Stephen. Because they were fans themselves. Absolutely, yeah. They they, they were Celtic supporters. Yeah. And that's what made it so special as well. And it was one time as well, Paul, when I think it was a uh, uh, William Neal, uh, uh, Joe McBride, uh, Bertie and Jimmy, and they were all talking. And they said, no, use, use, a, use a Celtic. Use a Celtic. The fans are Celtic. Mm-hmm. The fans are Celtic. We're, we're, we're just players. We're lucky to play for Celtic. We're lucky to play for you guys. He said, we're Celtic supporters as well. And maybe a... Maybe, uh, a today's player, maybe maybe they forget that. Maybe they forget to stop for the kid and sign headphones on, walk on by and, and whatever. Uh, that integration and that togetherness, especially this year, especially this year, but history's going, going to be made again. Mm-hmm. We're going to make history this year where there's going to be this special togetherness. If, if their players are, are walking by these young young kids or, or older gentlemen or older ladies or what, middle-aged, they have got to stop and we're all in this together. We want, to, we want to do this for you guys. We're not just here for the money. We're here for Celtic history. We're here. We're here for you people and to make this happen. So that's a very important wee message that you've gave there, Stephen, that it would be great if the players became even more... Active with with the with the fans running about when it's social, uh, even the social distance uh, allows that to happen. From speaking to yourself, from speaking to some of the Lisbon lines, I've been privileged enough to be in the presence of. It didn't even. It seemed as though it went further than a friendship with them. The bond was almost like a brotherhood. It was almost like they were brothers. Oh, absolutely. Um... Uh, I think you've nailed it there. Yeah, when they got when they got together, it was you know there was no secrets. They were they were together. They were um, yeah. It was just a, it was a family. You know you could see that um, from a distance, and you could see it when they were you know at, at home in private. You know it was there was no there was there was no separation between any of them. They were they were they were really really tight. Um, and I don't know if that's the way if that's something that's unique and I. I Again, I don't know if the modern football allows for them to get that close, but these guys lived in each other's pockets, and there's obviously the Lisbon one. Obviously, when they went to America before um, before that season, I think that was that, that really forged it um, for life amongst them. Um, and yeah, they, they just I think even you can see how emotional they got. You know, as as the lines have passed away. You know, just interviewing. Them. It was, it's, fa- it's family members passing away, it's not just teammates, you can see that in them. You can, it's a, it's a good point you made there, because obviously since we won the European Cup 53 years ago, there has been the anniversaries and videos, documentaries, that kind of thing, and as a youngster, I remember the 25th anniversary, it was the, the Lionhearts video that came out. That's right, yeah. And then all the celebrations around the 50th anniversary, and you, you can see them, because you're growing up, you're becoming a man, and you can see them becoming old men, and you can see... The likes of Bertie, for example, becoming more and more emotional as the years go on when he's talking about those that have passed. And uh, one thing I think that's really important, 53 years on, we still have the, the bloodline of the Lisbon Lions at Celtic Park with John Clark. And that baton was more or less passed on from Neely Mocking because Neely had been the trainer. He passed away, unfortunately, in 94 uh, as a kit man by then. John Clark, after a short spell in between, picks up that bat and he's still there. How important is that, that they're still represented there? Yeah, and I think when you're in Celtic Park, you're kind of, you can't forget it, you know, it's, it's very much in the DNA um, and having these guys around just to connect to, you know, be it 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years ago about, did you know this is what happened and even telling the younger kids, which is something that, that I'm big on as well, just explaining to them you know, what it means to, to be representing and have that badge on their jersey. Um, it's workers that are there that, that all understand it. Um vast majority of people in that ground are support and understand the, what it's about. Um, and, yeah, but keep maintaining those traditions, I think, is is the essence of what Celtic's about. Um, and it's really, really important for that we all beat the drum for that and we all... Um, yeah, 
just maintain it and pass it on. You know, that was, it was passed on to me. I'm, I'm really going to make sure I pass it on to anyone else I bump into. It's incredible. When I think 25 years ago was 1995, and I remember the 25th anniversary of Lisbon really, really well. But it's, it seemed even then like 100 years ago, yep. you know, but it wasn't really. But now, obviously, three years ago, we had the 50th anniversary celebrations. How special was that for the Chalmers family? Yeah, um, it's it's obviously been quite an emotional time because obviously my, pa- my papa struggled um, with dementia and stuff. So that was a really, really difficult thing for us all to deal with. There was the, like, so the concert and the celebrations, which my papa unfortunately couldn't make. That was... That was difficult um, for everybody, um, but again, it's just it's just another example of the pride that we all have um, that uh, people are are still wanting, still want to talk about it, and still wanting to celebrate it and know the importance of it. You know, anyone who's got that terrible affliction of dementia at that point is that when you saw his brothers rallying around him as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, Bobby was was very supportive, um, and obviously similar things were happening with Billy as well, um, and it was really difficult. And I think probably the guys found it really difficult. Um, spoke uh, spoke a few times to Bertie about it, and I think you know it was a real challenge for them to to to, to see that. Um, and it's a decline. It's a horrible, horrible um, affliction on anybody, um, and it's not just the person. It's the it's the people round about, um, which makes it really difficult. Um, but yes, the, the, the people round about him did did rally, um, and certainly the family rallied round him. Um, my aunts and uncles were incredible, around, uh, really supporting them. Um, but yeah, it was, it was tough. No, oh, absolutely. I, I, I remember speaking to an ex Celtic player who said that Celtic were unique in the emotional aspect of the fans towards the club and I think that's right and a lot of fans will say that it's the same everywhere I, I think Celtic are a very emotional club and that, that obviously is part of that is, is the fan base but one of the most emotional times really was in the year where we lost uh, Billy McNeil and your papa mm-hmm. and, the, and the team on the pitch, pitch was doing so well but there was a magical element to it when you know we were talking earlier about the numbers and how the numbers were just falling for heaven, and you've got Simunovic, number five, scoring in the sixty-seventh minute. I couldn't. And you're open up, looking up to know. the heavens, thinking, "I couldn't this believe is special. that." You I know? couldn't believe it. Um, that, that was unreal. Um, I also remember getting in, and um, you never walk alone. Um, was there that really, really choked me? And I, I wasn't expecting it. I actually never knew they were doing a minute silence and stuff around about the time. I, I should have known, but my, my head was all over the place. Um, and yeah, it was just there is there's a there's a magic to it. There's a there's a coming together, um, and you can see it's a people and it's a cause that, that come together in a time like that uh, to to support one another. And it was a great tribute in the cup final as well. Unbelievable. Um, as I, I said to you earlier, um, I managed to get I think it was Chris Ayers uh, tracky top. Which isn't my build at all, um, but yeah, that's got pride of place, and that that's again a really really nice touch from the club, um, which again you would expect. You know, you know, I know, I know what that that, that side of things are at Celtic. They, they do they do look after, um, and 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 kind of you know they do commemorate you know the the, the, the people definitely. You know, I speak to a lot of ex footballers who say they want to capture their their story. In the form of a book, and they, and a lot of the time they want to do it for their kids and for their grandkids, and and pass that on. But I remember reading your papa's story, and it was incredible how difficult his early life was, wasn't it, with illness, and he, he was able to overcome that. A proper yeah. warrior. Yeah, the the it was TB meningitis, wasn't it? He had um, that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think was a was effectively a death sentence at that time, um, and I think he was a bit of a, a medical miracle that he that he managed. To survive, let alone come back and, and have the amazing career that he had. Um, but he was very, very fit. He was a fit, fit guy. Even um, everybody I've spoke to says he was one of the fittest. Um, was near pick on him if you look at the old photographs. Um, so he came back for that. Um, came back for his leg break as well, which was was bad. Um, so I had a few a few downs, but I think he had a quite he was quite single minded 
um, which probably you find a lot of the sort of top sportsmen are quite single minded and know how know what they've got to do to go and achieve. So, as a youngster, then mm-hmm. being born into the Chalmers family, what's your early memories actually going to watch the the team? Uh, watching Celtic, um, I was saying to you before, I probably I would have been at other games earlier, but I remember my first memory was Paul McStay's testimonial, um, and it was a foggy, foggy night. Anyone that was there. Um, I think Celtic won three one. Um, I always remember Steve Bruce's voice sort of bellowing through the fog. That was that was always heard. Um, but I think from there, just the you know just the feeling of the atmosphere around about it, just the you know you just felt as if you're walking into walking into your, your, your family room. To be honest, there was there was just sitting down me man. There's a there's a sweetie. Um, was all that stuff. So it wasn't really. I don't know if people might be expecting. You know, I was I was in the director's box and all that when I was younger. That wasn't the case at all. It was just it was going as a fan. Um, had a season book all the way through. Um, you know, yeah, Martin O'Neill, John Barnes, um, Tony Mowbray's all the way through. I've kind of experienced highs and lows there, as as all Celtic fans have. Um, but yeah, just I was hooked quite early. I didn't have much choice either, to be honest. That was <laughs> that was a uh, that was going to be my club, and that was what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think back to you know just getting introduced to Celtic, getting introduced to going to the games, and you'd have been about twelve when we stopped to ten. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And then really since then, although there's been a few hiccups, like you say, the John Barnes era, the Tony Mowbray era, quite a lot of success as well between that period of time up until now, and we're going for the ten. I mean, oh, I yeah. never thought I'd see it, Stephen. No, I mean I've I've certainly known a lot more positives than I have downs, and even younger guys I know that feels as if they haven't seen any downs yet. So, and that's you've got to kind of remember that how incredible the achievement has been to get to nine in a row up until now, um, and God willing, we get to ten. That'll just be I'll make them, you know, in many ways immortal, and it'll be you know the questions will be asked, you know, how good is this team in the the, the wider context of things at Celtic? So. Yeah, there's there's been great ups and there's been some downs as well. Um, but I remember European games that were unbelievable being there as a fan. And um, again, just you feel the atmosphere around it. You don't you don't hear it. You feel it in your skin. I can still still remember back to the Barcelona games and Valencia. I always remember Valencia the penalties. Um, Juventus was probably one of my favourites. The the four three one as well. Big Sutton's volley. That was not probably one of my favourite games. Um, Nakamura's free kick it was just I mean we're just privileged to be Celtic fans in many ways aren't we incredible moments and Paul McStay obviously you've gone to the the testimonial there and I had a special bond maybe differently from from others Jim with Tommy Burns because my first game was a Tommy Burns testimonial my first season ticket was in Tommy's managerial debut season did you feel the same with McStay you had a wee affinity with Paul McStay yeah, well, I remember, I'm sure I had McStay in the back of my, my Celtic top when I was younger as well. Um, he was just a top, top player, wasn't he? But again, every time I met him, going back to how humble a lot of these Celtic guys were, I just couldn't believe how down to earth and lovely a guy he was. Um, I was remember my gran, if you see him, make sure you go up and say hello, he's a lovely boy. Um, and I'm fortunate enough now to know um, his nephew, John, McStay as well, so... Um, it's just a, just a, that's a, that's a proper Celtic family that. Um, oh yeah. And I, I think I said to you before I was um, I'd met him once or twice when I was younger, um, but then I was I lived in Australia there for just over a year, um, and I knew he was over there. So and my, I was forever like, see if you can look him up. I, I, I thought no, I'm not going to do that. He'll not remember me. Um, I remember I was in Sydney City Centre and I was in a in a shopping centre. Up this spiral staircase out of the corner of my eye, there's there's Paul McStay. Brilliant. And I thought, oh, jeez, all right, I need to go and say hello to him. I says, look, I says, excuse me, Paul, I says, you'll not remember, oh, Stevie, how are you? And I was like, oh, I couldn't believe it when he said, I felt 10 feet tall that Paul McStay would remember who I was. Um, spoke about him for a wee while there, um, and uh, it turned out his office was just across, across the road from where that shopping centre was, but uh, he's, a, he's a great man, he's a great family as well, great people. That's another family where it, it ran in the family, didn't it? So aye, aye. Football talent. Aye, aye, absolutely. The Paul McStay testimonial, you're right. It was uh, it was a misty night, spooky night. Mm-hmm. I was actually supposed to play in that testimonial game. Play? Play. Imagine that. 
But what happened was Brandon, who's my son, he took a hernia that day. We didn't know it was a hernia. Got rushed to hospital that oh. night. And that was me. And he was a dilemma, guys. He was a dilemma. I'm sitting there and and I'm going, hey man, you're all right, and you? I'm okay. That I, I know, I know. Right, okay. What do you think? What do you think? I, no, I, oh, and he's, he's crying. He was a really young, he was a little baby. Um, and uh, I don't actually think he said that because I don't think he could talk, actually, to be honest. I think I was willing to talk to him. And the wife's gone, you're not going away. I said, well, I'm quiet. I said, anyway. Lo and behold, I didn't get in the game, I didn't get to play, and that was it. Because we all got assigned a, a Paul McStay testimonial. A, I don't know if you remember, but an A4 frame. That's the only thing I got. That was it. You were going to get a game. So, uh, Stevie, I've got to say thanks for bloody reminding me about that and bringing that memory back. <laughs> well, well, Stevie, uh, Jim almost got a game at Almost Celtic so. Park and I, I've Aye. kind of blasted on did about mine. Did you get a game? I, I did, did, I did, you? yeah. Have you told that story to anybody yet? <laughs> what about yourself? What's been your experience of playing at Celtic Park? Um, oh, I've had a, a, a couple of wee things. I've um, managed a few kickabouts near the end of the season when everything's finished. Um, I remember I was doing the kind of play in the park thing. That the, I was one of the coaches um, and I remember me and a few of my pals were all, got on a bit early just to check the surface, you know, just to check it was it was rolling all right. Turns out it was. Um, so, managed to be kicky about. So, there must have been somebody up in the stand that saw us. Um, and we were kind of crossing and finishing to each other. And he put the Champions League music on. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Did, did it inspire you uh, any more, Stevie? Uh, huh? I needed a wee minute. I'll put it that way. It was, it was, uh, it was really special. Um, it's just a special place, isn't it? I think even... Not even as a Celtic fans, you know, you can go through all the great players that have been there and they'll all tell you how amazing it is. Um, obviously, when it's full, but even though I used to get a wee kick about on it, and you just, just realise how big it is as well when you're on there. Um, you know, you think you can run and then you, and then you see and you shout at these guys from the stand, why, why are you not covering that ground? Aye, you give it a go. It gives a wee bit more of an appreciation. It certainly does. Yes. I mean, it's the ones that used to just, like Van Dyke used to just strike a pass yes. 60 yards, you know. Yes. But, but there's Van there you're talking about Van Dyke. You know what's so special about him in these games? And this was a, this was a friend of mine that actually spoke to me about this as well. He said, you know, Simmy, Van Dyke is just Mr. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then I went, by the way, you're right. Doesn't the mark, even under pressure, he didn't look under pressure. You knew right away, didn't you, he, when you saw him? He like, knew. Oh. He looked, I mean, I love Sam Cook and the music and all that. And uh, Sam Cook was one cool dude, right? And when I think here, you know, big man's like that as well. And that's what I think we need to get, you know, big Julian at the back. Is we're just being cool under pressure. And uh, uh, it's brilliant when these players just look cool under pressure. Here's how you think for you, Stevie. Uh, Everybody talks about the, the, the goal, which we'll never stop talking about, and mm-hmm. I know I'll teach it forever and ever. Apart from that goal, is there any other goal that sticks in your memory? I think he said cup final Aye. goals, and he said hat tricks, um, and that there's a kind of the toe poke one front post. Um, I think that was against Rangers as well. That it kind of gets showed. Um, I think he scored. He scored quite a few headers as well, and he wasn't. He, it wasn't he overly tall. Um, but it was always, I, always do, I do remember when he was younger, uh, to me, you work on your, your weaker foot, or oh, work on your left foot, work on your left foot. Um, and then later I seen him doing toe pokes with his right foot across <laughs> his left foot. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, he scored an awful lot of goals at Celtic. Right, he's, right. Was he fifth or sixth now, I think, in terms of all, all-time goal scorers? Mm-hmm. Um, so, aye. I, I think he was, a, kinda, he was a, a pretty pure goal scorer as well. I don't think they were... I don't think they had to be worldies all the time, you know. Yeah. Plenty of guys that scored worldies round about them, right enough. I know, and, and see when you think about the fact that your papa was part of a team that were the trailblazers, every team that's come since then has tried to replicate and emulate what the Lisbon Lions have done. It's obviously never happened. During your lifetime with supporting Celtic, what period did you look upon and think, we maybe will make an impact, a real impact in Europe? Was it the O'Neill years? Certainly the O'Neill years were special as a Celtic fan um, because I think you felt as if you could go anywhere and you could get a result. I think you felt as if you could play anyone and compete with them. Um, it wasn't necessarily what you 
and I'm sure the guys would be the first to say it's really necessarily what everybody had in their head has been the Celtic way of playing. Um, but we had top, top players then. Guys who could have played, you know, with anybody really. Um, and as I said earlier, we showed it. You know, we went and played against you know, whoever came to Celtic Park. It was a, it was a total fortress. Um, but yeah, the new the new years were special. But, you know, we had some special nights under Gordon Strachan as well, I would have said. Um, obviously, your Man United's. Um, Good finale, yeah. Right? Your Benfica's and stuff like that with, with big, big games. And um, it's remarkable, really, some of the results we got at that time. Oh, it was, and some Celtic fans look back on you know Gordon Strachan's time and think to themselves, you know, he, he didn't play a really special brand of football. But when you look at his record, three titles and four, two Champions League last sixteens in a row. Yep, speaks for itself, doesn't it? Hundred um, percent. And again, some top players at that time as well, and some good academy graduates. If you, you know, if you think about you know the end of Martin O'Neill's period, there was a lot of aging players and there was players out of contract and whatever else to. And obviously with the real tough time at Bratislava, the, the first one there, but you think about coming from there to, you know, going and beating Man United and, mm-hmm. you know, your, your Nakamura's and just, yeah, I thought, Vanny, Vanny Gura Hesselink, you know, the, the special night we had up at yeah. Tanadice around the yep. um, time when Tommy Burns passed away as well. It was just, again, just, you could probably go through almost all years and say there was, there was some special players, um, but again, with some real special nights at that time. Uh, and it was a real privilege, I think, to... To kind of grow up and watch Celtic and be a season book holder at that time was brilliant. See, when you look at the, you know, the traditions of the club being built on the youth policy, you know, bringing through the vast majority of the Lisbon lines, for example, and that continued through the Quality Street Gang. Then you've got people like, you know, Tommy Burns and Roy Aiken, Paul McStay, and it goes on and on. How difficult is it now, do you think, to continue with that tradition but still strive to make progress in Europe? Um, well, I think. Y- I mean, if you look at Celtic's first team just now, and you're saying probably your most important players in terms of Cal McGregor and uh, James Forrest, um, obviously Mikey Johnson coming through, and there's a few few more underneath. There's, there's there, there is top players there, and there's important players there for Celtic. Um, I think a lot of the time it's down to the players as well, and the gauntlet been thrown down to them. Like, okay, go and show that you're you're better than you know the, the player who've spent a few million pounds from. Um, from France or wherever else, go and show that you're you're better than them. Because um, at the end of the day, if you're if you're showing it in training and you, that you're better than somebody else, then then you get the opportunity. I would say. Um, but is it more difficult? Possibly. Um, the, the current climate as well. We don't really know, you know, how the kind of virus is going to affect contracts for players and how the, the, the knock on effect from that across the game is going to be. You would like to think young players will get more opportunities. Um, it's a really difficult one this year, obviously, because um, do you throw the pressure of 10 in a row on a, a young, young kid um, as well? Again, if they're ready for it, then, then they will get the opportunity. But I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a kind of age-old problem about feeding players in at the right time. and You know, you don't get a lot of walk-in time at Celtic. You really need to hit the ground running if you're a, a young player, or any player, to be honest. Mm-hmm. When you look at the nine in a row era that we're still part of and it's and it's continuing, and you look at how the team and the clubs developed from the early days of Neil Lennon winning the first title through the Ronnie Dyla years, Brennan Rogers, the disappointment of how that ended, and then Neil coming back. I mean, when you look at that and what we've achieved in that nine years, does it not just bring home to you how incredible the achievement was that Jock's team took the team for the entire nine Nine seasons, amazing, and, unbelievable. You know, and a great core of that side was there throughout, yeah. the, throughout that period as well. Uh, again, yeah, unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, maybe the era of managers staying for ten years is is good, but obviously the manager just now's made. He's been away and coming back again, and it looks a great fit for the club. And he's obviously, you know, he he gets it. You know, he really gets what we're about. So, um, but yeah, the game's changed. Um, in terms of the outside noises and probably what players do away for the pitch gets highlighted much more but um, it's an unbelievable achievement where we are just now and just hope we can get that, that push to get us make sure we get get that next one which will, which will put these guys you know in legend forever Oh it definitely would Now you're a massive Celtic fan we know that but you're also passionate about coaching Yep How, how did you get into coaching yourself? Um. Do you know what? I 
think I've always really had it in my head. I think I think back to the early things, I think I probably get frustrated thinking about how I was coached and thinking about which I think a lot of coaches are frustrated players anyway. Um I was probably thinking about um, you know, running round pitches without a ball for forty five minutes at a time, knowing that's wrong, and then probably thinking I want to, to, to change this. So I was it was actually in high school, um, my PE teacher puts through a very first coaching badge and really just from there I've probably just went on and, and always done it. I was in community football coaching, um, did that for a, a good bit, doing all sorts of different projects, working with you know, working with dementia, disabled disability programmes, uh, school programmes, uh, employability, loads and loads of stuff. Um and managed to get away to different trips. So went away to America um, a few different times, found some different um, methodologies and different ways of doing things there, which was great. Um, and then I got involved in the Girls Academy at Celtic. Did a wee bit there for a, f- um, for a few years and was fortunate to work with some really, really talented players um, and really, really enjoyed that. It was a great education for me. Um and yeah, just ended up, went to Australia, worked in a, a football academy over there, um, kind of ran it, and a, yeah, again, different way of doing things, different climate, um, try to get kids to 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 play at the temple we play here, and getting frustrated, mm-hmm. and then you realise, oh wait, it's 40 degrees, that's why they can't sprint back and forward the same way as we can in Glasgow. Um, so again, that was really good education, and came back and I've kind of worked at a couple of, a couple of um, Club Academy Scotland clubs now and um, just working with some of the most talented kids in the country. So it's been brilliant, but I just love working with the younger kids as well. I just get great energy from them. I get um, I love bouncing off them and, and, and seeing their wee, wee faces light up when they just see a ball at their feet and a goal. It's, it's brilliant. Um, and yeah, it's just it's been my life, to be honest. You know, Scotland's a football nation, Jim, and we mm-hmm. talk about it a lot with Jim being obviously yep. involved with the Jimmy Johnson Academy. Um, and we're always looking at when Scotland is going to produce, you know, the talent that we produced before and in the numbers that we produced it in before. And, I, and sometimes the gauge is European success or the Scottish national team's success. Do you see enough in your role when you're coaching to believe that the talent is still there? That the, there's absolutely talent, yeah, absolutely. Um, whether there's more distractions for kids when they hit teenage years, or whether there's um, more options potentially for kids, I think probably even when I was young, um, probably when you guys were, were younger as well, you went out in the street, you kicked a ball. I've heard you guys talk about this in the podcast before that that was what we did. You learned one of the biggest educations you probably get is when you're, you know. Seven, eight year old, and you're playing against a fourteen year old. Well, that's actually brilliant because you learn. Right, I can't. I can't go physical with him. I need to learn to hold control the ball or, or protect it on this side. And guess what? When the two years are, when he's become adults, those skills are, are, are there. Um, and I just think you know that street football element. And and what I have to say is that a lot of academies now are trying to really reintroduce that the the, the street football thing. So it's kind of went full circle from being coached and coached and coached and everything was coming from the adult to now the players taking more responsibility and the players um, setting up their own practices, evaluating themselves, what did I do well there? You know, um, we do a wee thing where the, the kids have to go and do their own street football practice before they come to training. So it might be, right, we need to hit the ball off the pole or it's a crossbar challenge or it's World Cup or something like that, but the coaches stand away. Shut up, don't say anything, it's for them. And it, and probably through your own coach education, that, that's you're kind of fighting your instincts because you always want to say, oh, what if you kick it this way or what if you do that? In actual fact, they need to discover it. Mm-hmm. They need to figure it out. Absolutely. They, they need to understand what works for them as well. Now, if they come to you and ask, you know, how I'm not able to lift the ball off the ground or my, I can't use my left foot or whatever it is, then you can give them some wee pointers. But I think a lot of kids probably... I'm going to say maybe the last decade, 20 years, it's maybe been too much fed from the coach. It's been too much from, here's exactly how you do it. It's point A to point D to point C. When that's not the game. 
and that's not what happens when they end up playing at the weekend because guess what somebody's standing on B yeah. how, do you, how do you get to C so um, long long winded answer there is probably I think there's a lot more discovery happening now in youth football which I think is great Jim how satisfying is it like at the beginning of this week when you see one of the graduates from the Jimmy Johnson signing for Morton when Rabin Omar gets a, a, a brilliant move for the boy this week fantastic it's uh, very satisfying it's satisfying whether he, he sings for Morton, he sings for Celtic, or he, he sings for uh, uh, Manchester United or uh, any other team. It's fantastic. But uh, he, that young lad that, we, that we're talking about, he, he, Rabin, he's done well. He, we helped get him he, on the pathway to professional football. He then was handed on to the coaches within the clubs that he went to, so the part of his development. That's all we were was part of his development, help, helping them on the pathway. And uh, the, the, the club that we put them to were friends of uh, uh, the Jimmy Johnson Academy. Actually, we put uh, six players at the same age down there. And then from there, we helped them get to the next club. And from that club, we've actually helped him now. He came here and we've done one-on-ones with him when um, we thought maybe here's a wee chance here for Rabin to maybe step up Two leagues. And that's what we've done. So we worked with him he, together. Joyce, he was very instrumental in that as well. But he came here and he, he worked and he worked. We worked on a few different things with him. But importantly, what Stephen said, he worked on things himself. Yeah. He worked things out himself. And he's been that kind of kid, uh, and a young man now, that he's worked things, he's worked things out. So for him to go... Uh, from here to uh, the lower divisions of Scottish football, now he's made his way up in uh, two tiers, which I think is a fantastic jump from, and I think he'll do well uh, at Morton. And um, that's his next uh, uh, foot in the rung. And he's a young lad, he's, only, he's still only 20, 22, 1997. He's 1997. So he's 22, and I would like to even see him progress even even further. And again, I'm delighted that he, he, he Darnell, Darnell Fisher has progressed he, on he, to Celtic Football Club. He's progressed to English he, football. And so too uh, all the other uh, lads that's came through here as well. And hopefully in the future, when, when the girls' programme starts off as well, that will become uh, successful as well. But seeing young kids and young people progressing on to what they like doing it is nothing short of magic oh it must be to see them thrive special yeah. Stephen right. and it's probably what you say there Jim because you're right that every person that a player meets is just a step and it's something it's an, it's an opportunity for them to learn yeah. um, and, all, and the most important thing to take particularly for what you were saying there is it, it comes for the player it doesn't I think a lot of young kids that I was experiencing they were, and parents as well were expecting it's the coach will make the difference. No. The, the the coach coach can direct, the coach can show the path, the kid needs to walk down the path and the player needs to walk down the path. So that's probably what you were saying there. Mm-hmm. And you listen, now you've got a track record the, the working with these players, which is amazing. We, we, I, we've, we've got a we've got a cracking a, a track record. We don't have a multitudes and multitudes of teams, so so I think what we do is we a, a thing that I learnt for the, the lines was uh, been running about them in the, the latter stages there was that they were taught that if you cultivate a relationship with the players it, it, it becomes fruitful so it's just putting that wee bit extra in the name putting the wee extra in, it, it becomes special now here's the thing coaches coaches and good coaches are all out there but see try to find a good young player that wants to do that wee bit extra and have that wee different special attitude, which Stevie's talking about there as well. That that's that's when you know you've got somebody special. That's when you know, yeah, he's doing the things. It's a wee bit different. He may not be the best player at the moment, but everything else that he's doing, everything else he's doing when it comes to training and listening and putting the extra effort in. So sometimes the ones that have got the talent. I don't really want to do the work with the ones that's no get the talent and they become the ones that seem to progress more. 
Oh, definitely. I mean, for any Morton fans listening in, and I know there's a few, um, on the night that Rabin signed for Morton, he was up here doing a training session. Yeah. That's the dedication of the boy. So yeah. uh, we wish him all the best. Of course though, we Obviously, do. you know. Um, moving on from nine in a row, hopefully ten in a row, Steve. I'm not taking we'll anything for granted. It. You never we'll know. You it. never know. Where does Celtic go from there? This is a big question we've been asking on the podcast because we're all so fixed and focused, and quite rightly so, on... Nine in a row and now ten in a row, but then, then what? The game, I suppose the challenge then is to continue it, and I think probably the focus would switch from a fan's perspective to to Europe and what impact you can have there. I think that's probably getting more and more difficult year on year. Um, I don't think it's for the want of trying. I think still, um, still a real desire to do really well in European football because. You know, we're synonymous with it, come back to the lines and um, even after that. Um, so, yeah, I think the focus will be to try and compete in Europe. Um, but as a fan just now, I think I can't even think that far ahead. I just, and it, it's horrible because I'm not even, and, it, and it, this is unusual for me because normally I'm, I really want to make the impact in Europe. But uh, this year, the 10th. It's just a team. Well, <laughs> that's what we've been saying, isn't I know. it? Well, well, think about it, right? Jim and I were together when um, we got knocked out mm-hmm. by Cop- Copenhagen. And I remember we were driving up for London and during the first leg, the away leg, that we weren't at. And the disappointment at that time, because I felt Celtic were better than they actually showed yeah. over those two games. And you're looking at that fixture, oh, Copenhagen against Man United, wouldn't that be great quarterfinals? Actually, no, wouldn't it? Because that would just get in the way at the moment, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> and it's you, you, it's really messing with your head, isn't it? Because, you, 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 again, it's kind of, it's inbuilt into you that you want at Celtic, you want to win every game and you want to compete in all levels. But if it, and you've seen it with a lot of other clubs, particularly in the Europa League, even down in England, where, you know, they've maybe went and competed and done well in the Europa League, but they've, you know, in the verge of getting relegated or, or other clubs in, in other countries. So, um it's a real difficult one to try and, you know, piece together in your head. Um, this year it's, it's the 10. <laughs> Long and the short, I think, is the 10. And then after that, listen, we'll deal with it when it comes. But I think, um, yes, you'd want to start making an impact in Europe if you can. But again, it's so difficult now. It certainly is, well. No distractions. No, no distractions. No distractions. You know, we've been speaking to you today, Stevie. We really appreciate you coming in. It's been brilliant. It's been fascinating. And uh, all that's left for Jim and I to say is thank you for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. No, listen, thank you so much. I'm you know, surprised, actually, when, when Jim gave us a, a wee message to get involved and, and speak to you guys. But it's, it's a real, real pleasure. And all the very best with your, um, your podcast as you go forward. And good luck with whatever awards that I'm sure will start to, to roll in again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Thanks. 